Hello everyone, Isabella Reads and Amazon Made Simple. I want to make sure you're getting the biggest value as possible from my podcast and from every single video I put out there. Please make sure to subscribe to my newsletter that I am posting the link below this video and you'll be always up to date with the product research, validation and development. It's completely free, promotion free, pure value forever and ever. And so whatever you tell yourself, whatever you feed yourself into your mind first is going to happen in your real life. So if you tell yourself you're going to have a successful Amazon business, you better believe you're going to have a successful Amazon business because you're going to do the work to learn. You're going to do the work to implement. How many times you failed with the products? Did well, like it showed us that, holy crap, this system actually works. Regardless of how much money we lost on the first order, and they're all about saving, saving, savings. Zero risk. What How many get. people didn't pay you back? Yeah, she's like, I'll pay you whatever amount you want. I'm like, fuck it. Okay, let's try. Into this, if you're a beginner, be okay with shutting off a product. If you're running into a part where you start losing money, the easier life's going to be when building your actual brand. So social media present doesn't mean that you have to have a shit ton of followers. What is the sweet spot for the amount of influencers? Did you ever feel that one review is worse than no review? Hello, everyone. Isabella Reads and Amazon Made Simple podcast. Today I have cool guys. They're yeah. really cool. Uh, Zap Twins. A lot of people know them as Zap Twins. Nobody can sometimes tell the difference. <laughs> Eric and Brian are here. Sometimes I'm thinking I'm talking to one guy and then I'm realizing that's another one. So <laughs> anyway, anyway, we're going to talk about Amazon Tactics. A lot of you guys saw how they're doing masterminds and they're teaching people how to do Amazon and the way how they approach their business is very similar to mine. And what I love about them, there is no Lamba gurus, there is no fake advice, there is a lot of great real things. And today I'm going to throw into them a lot of questions, <laughs> questions that you usually ask me. And first of all, welcome to the podcast, guys. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much for having us. It's funny. We were just chit chatting before this and um, we were chatting about like the last time we tried to do this, we just talked forever and forgot to record the podcast. So yeah. super excited to be here. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Eric. I don't know if you can see my name probably hovering somewhere, but uh, obviously we look very similar today, but hopefully you guys can get through. Not just today. <laughs> yeah, every day, every day. Yeah, whole life. You got to see uh, who has the better mustache, and that should hopefully tell you. <laughs> oh, let's <laughs> guys funny. vote. Let's vote. Mustache, Brian mustache or Eric mustache? Like I'm Brian, by the way. <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yeah, I I, I I appreciate I appreciate you having us on, and um, you know, you you we share similar strategies when it comes to Amazon, and, and similar to what Eric had said, you know, we can talk forever and just collaborate and just have a good time, and it's because we have very like minds and uh not only in business but in mindset and and then also obviously in, in the amazon strategy so i'm looking forward to this because uh you know we're obviously going to get into the nitty-gritty about tactics and what's working on amazon and i think one thing you're going to realize with eric and us uh, eric and i is as much as there's amazon strategy as much as there's business tactic i think there is one main common denominator for any successful business owner and it's mindset um and oh, yeah. I think that we're going to have some really good conversations specifically around that, because if you can, I'm a firm believer that things happen in life in two different scenarios. The first is in your mind. So whatever you tell yourself, whatever you feed yourself into your mind first is going to happen in your real life. So if you tell yourself you're going to have a successful Amazon business, you better believe you're going to have a successful Amazon business because you're going to do the work to learn. You're going to do the work to implement. You're going to fail and you're going to have challenges in life and you're going to, going to come back up on top. And eventually you'll get to that point where it's going to work for you. Cause that's what business is. So you started it. with exact, almost exact question I wanted to ask you. So <laughs> how many times you failed with the products? That's number one. And that will lead you to another one. What was the product number X that actually made you believe that this shit is going to work and you're going to build a lot of products and Amazon is kind of your, we will not say lifetime venture, but several years venture that you want to commit you married amazon yeah at this point. we have a strong married relationship person. with amazon yeah. um i can i can start off with that um so we made a, a pretty big mistake on our first product honestly however with that said it was actually our first product that allowed us to believe in amazon believe it or not not everybody has the ability or first time around they they get lucky 
But the first time we launched our product, uh, we messed up on a couple of big things. Number one, you know, we trusted the person on YouTube that recommended this specific freight forwarder. And because of that, we got screwed over big time when it came to shipping. We spent way more than we had to um, on that. In addition to that as well, um, you know, we, we learned off of YouTube originally and um, we ended up relabeling everything or not relabeling, but labeling all of our products wrong. We didn't have the right barcode on our individual units. So we had to actually redirect our shipment, take it to a warehouse, which we had to pull off last minute, get it relabeled. And then we had to spend a crap ton of money redoing that. So it cost us about eight grand Canadian in excess to do everything there. That was over 3000 units, which is a pretty big was order. For eight first grand on top of the cost of inventory or what was it yeah. in total? On top yeah, of so, inventory. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so cost of goods was not a thing at, the, at this point anymore. You just had to sell and figure out how the strategy works. Exactly. Exactly. In addition to that as well, sorry. Um, one of the other big mistakes, this is also calculated into the 3000 units as well is uh, we didn't size the product correctly. <laughs> so it was actually okay. just barely in a, in a um, oversized product, like just barely like one millimeter over or something like that. Um, so we learned, we implemented those changes in the second time around. And luckily that product did well. Like it showed us that, holy crap, this system actually works. Right. And because of that, you know, the next time around we made those changes. The next time around it was it, it crushed it for Can us. Can you specify so, what kind of changes did you make? How much money did you save after you made the changes? And how by like by, by what percentage you got bigger profit yeah. after you made the changes? So where was this main failures and wins at this yeah, yeah. totally. Um so I think the small or uh, from small oversized to large standard size, I can't remember the exact, I think it was like 85 cents or 90 cents per unit, over 3000 units. So quite a bit of money right there. Um, so that was a, a big portion to it. And we were selling the product was 1999. So pretty low ticket. But the margin on that, you know, basically a dollar extra per unit that we're getting, that's a that's a lot of money. You know what I mean? Like back in the day, cost per clicks weren't as high as they were these days. But um, what you know, was you, the year? This was 2018, right, Brian? Okay. Yeah, very end. Uh, we launched in, uh, actually, no, it was 2019. 2018 is when the production order was happening, and we launched in May of 2019. Oh, yeah. So you launched right after all this Amazon TOS came out with like no more giveaways, no more uh, you know, reviews, and no more all this. Uh, yeah dark stuff can be happening the gray hat stuff yeah. yeah yeah we did launch right after that with that being said we still implemented it because at that time um at that pretty much at that mistake we're like we need to we need to start working with someone and this is when a gentleman uh, in our local community kind of came in held our hand through the changes that we needed to made and that's where we really realized the power of mentorship realistically we made those changes and regardless of how much money we lost on the first order we had a clear path to profit on the second order. And that's why we just bit the bullet and just went for another production run. And that product, uh, it took off. Uh, and then that product was the the product that made us the uh, gave us the confidence to be able to actually walk away from our jobs and spend full time in Amazon. Um, what was we, for you this launch? Was it like a lifetime commitment? I want to do business and make money off Amazon. Or it's more like adventure. Let me try if it's going to work. Yeah, mm. I'll, I'll share a, I'll share a little bit of our story. I think uh, it'll it'll give some really really good context in um, who we were wanting to start this business for a reason. So growing up, we were always we were always these we called ourselves young hustlers. And you know, although we didn't think of business or entrepreneurship as a thing, a lot of the things that we did inhibited these skills. To kind of give you perspective, we would buy cars, fix cars, and sell them for a profit. We would buy clothes wholesale, we would flip them at a skate park because we used to be skater boys. We were always trying to do things to make money. One of the biggest and most lucrative opportunities that we had, and uh, I'm always hesitant to say it, but I say it anyways, because I just embrace our experience with it was we had these things called Zab loans. So we literally are one of the few people that were actually working as early as we possibly can. So we had a paper route growing up. As soon as we were 14, we got a part-time job at McDonald's and then we started working in car dealerships. We were good with our money and it's because of our parents. They were very frugal. They didn't take a lot of risk and they were all about saving, saving, savings, zero risk. So keep that in mind because it'll make a little bit more sense later in the, in, in the story. Um, but all said and done, we had this thing called Zab loans where we would literally, 
loan out the money that we had in our bank accounts for, I kid you not, 100% interest rates. And there was people that would bite. And I was <laughs> explicitly tracking the amount of money that we made in our grade 11 and 12 year. And we made over 30 grand in profit within our grade 11 and 12 year, which is a lot of money for someone that doesn't have any expenses. They just got their driver's license. You really just put money into cars. And we leveraged that to make more money. It's really what it How came many down. people didn't pay you back? zero like every yeah. single person paid us back um we didn't just you know send it out to everyone they're more so friendly was it legal circle. or no. you just like listen guys we're well gonna technically not but you know we'll push yeah. that under the rug yeah okay got it <laughs> we more so did it with friends um to be quite frank friends that party let's just keep it at that and i don't want to say we took advantage of the situation we more so were like hey we'll be we'll this be a helping opportunity candidate. yeah um, but that kind of, again, it just inhibited the fact that we wanted to do business and be in business. And our natural first thought was, okay, what are jobs that we could potentially do that where we put in hours and we can make more money? And it was a commission-based job. So we went to school, uh, we studied marketing, and then we there was this uh, diploma program where you um, specialize in professional sales specifically, which gave you an internship afterwards. And it really got us into the road of corporate. And really, we call ourselves entrepreneurs, being business owners within a business because we had our own clients. We had to communicate with them. We had to sell them an opportunity. And the harder that we worked, the more hours that we put in, the more commission and the more money that we would earn as opposed to just a flat salary. Now, my parents... Again, going back that they were very risk averse. They're immigrants. They really didn't want to take any risk. In fact, my dad made one investment and he lost all of his money. And that just made him never want to take any risk. And they didn't even want us to do business or you know be in any kind of business-based role. They're like, get a stable job, be in, uh, become an engineer, become a doctor. A lawyer. Yeah, something that you know is going to be a forever thing and take that long-term career out. So when we decided to be in business, we went against the grain with what they said. They trusted us. And then we got a great job. We started making literally over $200,000 a year at the age of 20 and 21. In between two of you or each? No, each. Each individually, yeah. Okay. So it's yeah. four, 400 grand. Yeah. 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 We were making good money. There's no questions about it. But we were yeah. working like animals. Like dogs. And, you know, that was great experience. But more importantly, it gave us the opportunity to realize that money wasn't the answer here, that freedom was. And all of that money we leveraged to put in, not all of it, but we leveraged to make our first investment. And our first investment ever was into our Amazon business. And then when we started to realize that we can make money while we sleep, while we realized that a system can be in place where you don't have to trade your time for money anymore, that's what shifted our minds forever. And then our business blew up during actually, as you can imagine, our, our, this brand was an organizational based brand. So how we positioned it on Amazon was, hey, you're stuck at home, organize. And we saw a lot of markets crashed, a lot of markets increased, and our market was one that increased. And um, we just went full force. We're like, fuck this. We were depressed. We were like not happy at all, super stressed and anxious. And we just you know, just literally quit our jobs and focus on the business full time. And uh, we're here now. So, uh, so you did, you've been entrepreneurs, then you got the job and then you quit the job to become entrepreneurs again, to continue your, your adventure. Exactly. exactly. Uh, listen, that's something here to say. I like, as you probably know, I, I launched my first business when I was 17. Yeah. And then at the age of, I think I was 25 my previous uh, boss called me and she said, listen, I want you to work for me. I'm like, listen, I can't work for anybody after I worked for almost seven years just for myself. It's mm -hmm. just damn near so impossible. Hard. Yeah, she's like, I'll pay you whatever amount you want. I'm like, fuck it. Okay, let's try. <laughs> so she hired me. I, I, I was hired and it took me three months Till I was hating every single day. And at the same time, I was managing my business and I was having joy there because here's yep. I'm the boss and then here I am the employee. And even I was the employee as like as a head of the department that I had to build and run, I hated it. Mm -hmm. And then I quit. Of course. Of course I did. It took, but it took me almost six months 
to be able to quit. And I didn't quit on a good terms because I had to quit and she didn't want me to quit. So I feel you 100% when you've yeah. been able to. And these days when sometimes I'm asking myself, especially when like you are in a business hustle, business cannot be always growing. It's always yeah. upside down. And when it's down, I'm questioning myself, do I want to go to get a job? I'm like, and then I'm just imagining to wake up, to go somewhere to work for somebody, to accomplish tasks that you're being asked and you have a limit. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I rather not to have any income at some point and then rocket sales yeah. instead of just being a slave. So totally, like, I, I really feel you would like all my <laughs> bones. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when you guys launched the first product, you figured it out, you adjusted things. Uh, what was next? And when did you um, came up with an idea, an under not idea, understanding that now these days you have to build a brand? Yeah. Because it's about branding, storytelling, and there is no more flipping the cars and reselling stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think the first, so our first product, we did actually make that product different. However, um, you know, we talked about failures at the beginning. After that first product, we actually did go and launch products that were me too products, like ones that made us money for a short period of time. And eventually we were like, you know what, we're going to stop selling them because we can tell that the competition in the market is going to eat us. So before we started losing a crap ton of money on a couple of products, we started losing money. And some of them we were like, there is no clear path to the success of this product. And I think for anybody that's listening to this, if you're a beginner, be okay with shutting off a product. If you're running into a part where you start losing money, screw it. There's more products that you can launch that you're going to do way better on. So I, I would say, you know, product number two, we launched had a clear path to differentiation. Product three and four were the two products that we ended up discontinuing. And then after that period, it was kind of like really kind of started settling and that's when i think during a lot of people started selling on amazon or started doing anything online to make money online and i think at that point it was a clear indication that you really needed to or honestly during you really needed to build a brand it wasn't about launching a product it was about finding a product with a clear pain point for a customer solving that pain point and even if the numbers make sense nowadays and there's nothing that you can solve for, we don't go and launch that product. There has to be something you solve for. There has to be somebody you talk to. And there has to be a customer that you can serve over a lifetime. And if you can do that, that right, and you can retain that customer over a lifetime, then you're going to be well off. You're going to be much better than 80% of the people that are selling on Amazon that are just trying to sell product over product over product that will make money for a good period of time. But if you can retain that customer, it's going to be much more profitable for you because at the end of the day, your most expensive thing that you can do in any business, regardless of it's running an agency or running a consulting business or anything like that, or selling products is acquiring a customer. You now need to know how you can talk to them, how to relate to them, how you can serve them, what products will they want to see in the future. The better you do that at the beginning, the easier life's going to be when building your actual brand. 100%. <laughs> problem solving. The moment you find a problem here and you're understanding that you can solve this problem fast, uh, uh, then you have the very short distance to your for, to your cash flow. And this is where like your client is happy. You're happy. Your cash flow is just here. You're at the point Doing where good. you have to scale. Yeah. So what is the, when I was watching your guys on social media, First of all, you're doing great. Like the amount of uh, you. followers you have, the amount of comments and applauses and engagement and every single post you're putting out there is phenomenal. Uh, no question here. Question is, how are you, like what is the trickiest trick you teach your uh, followers, your students uh, when it comes to the launching? So what do they do? What do you recommend them to do to get into this huge amount of sales that are that they are making within the first month? Because when I saw your screenshot, it's like 20 grand first week or first month, 100 grand. I'm like, damn, what these guys are doing? <laughs> it's such a magic. So if you don't mind, please share. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can dive into that. Um, I think what's important to note is that there isn't just one thing that you need to do. There is many things that you need to do. Um, yeah. And we, we call it a flywheel, 
because there's a lot of things that need to be working and coasting with each other. Um, one of the big things, obviously, Amazon's a search engine. So there's keywords that you need to go after. And one thing that's very important to us, especially with the caliber of students that we bring into our program, there are people that were very similar to us, very risk averse. This might have been their first investment, and they're looking for a route for freedom. They want to have an additional income stream. They want to maybe have that income stream replace their income eventually and do this full time. They really inhibit the journey that we have been through when it comes to selling on Amazon and the life that Amazon has provided to us. So we really take that into consideration. So first of all, when it comes to launching on Amazon specific, it being a search engine, being very strategic with the keywords that you go after, right? And running a direct paper kick campaign. I'm gonna get Eric to dive into that afterwards, but the, in my opinion, a massive influx in sales that is low cost, high ROI is building an audience on the front end. And I'm a firm believer of someone that takes a book out or takes a page out of someone else's book. And we learned this directly from Ryan Moran. I'll give him full credit to this. And he has this philosophy of co called stacking the deck. And he talks about building an audience of about a hundred thousand people. And you can do that through building your own audience, but mm, getting to a hundred thousand people takes a long period of time. But you can also do that by leveraging influencers. You can do that by building a Facebook community, things along those lines. And all you're really doing is creating content and trying to take people throughout that journey. So they're bought into the vision. And this is where branding comes in, really trying to resonate and understand who at the end of the day that you are trying to resonate with. So all of your marketing, all of your content, all of your email, like everything that you do on the front end to stack that deck in your favor is all resonating with them so that you build so much value that it's just instinct for them to purchase your product on the front end. This external traffic coming into Amazon helps the algorithm like crazy. And this is where the surge in sales come in. Obviously your BS, BSR will, will shoot right, right, well, much lower. Organic rank starts to happen, but it's also very important to know that you need to have strong pay-per-click strategy, but it doesn't mean going crazy with a shit ton of keywords. You can, if you have the budget, in fact, we encourage it if you have the budget for the ones that are a little bit more cautious, we do take a significantly different approach and we really try to hold their hand through that. So I'll get Eric to dive into pay-per-click strategy in specific that we, that we get into, uh, that we get our students to dive into specifically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the biggest to unpack and Eric, before you will start, uh, unpacking the PPC, uh, could you please mention how do you teach your, or like maybe not how do you teach, how do you implement the external traffic based on the influencers? Because every single expert I'm talking to, uh, given the same advice, you are going to influencers, you are texting them, this is how you can find their contact information. And then you have to go through 300 of them, maybe one will reply and then maybe something <laughs> will happen. Do you have any secret secret under secret, under secret that we that you can unpack and give a hack. How person that never spoke to anybody uh, like influencers can reach out the influencers, the bloggers that will be willing to promote their product and here the magic will happen. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a tough one, absolutely. What we like tell our students to do is have a 30 day period of building a social media presence. Because the last thing that you want to do is go and reach out to an influencer where you have no presence. They're obviously going to say no. In fact, they'll probably just ignore your message as a whole. So social media presence doesn't mean that you have to have a shit ton of followers. It means that you have to have viable content that also resonates with them. Okay. So create gap graphics. You can do this at scale with AI nowadays by leveraging Canva as a plugin with ChatGPT. And it's super easy to do. And or you can use Canva templates, like it's super easy to do. You just need to have a clear understanding of what your brand vision is for one and who your customer is for two. Okay. If Are you, you thinking that, here about your customer customer or you're thinking about customers slash influencers that will look into your uh, account that will consider you as your potential and as his, pot her, their correct. potential client. So when you're creating that content, you're thinking of both. Absolutely. In fact, the influencers that are best to line up for a launch are going to be the ones that are your direct customer or and or influence an audience that is of similar capacity. There are a ton of influencers out there that are a little bit more broad, but you'll see in their story highlights, for example, that they specifically focus on like four different core areas, for example. So trying to spend the time to do that. And yes, it will take thousands of messages. Yes, you might get 100 responses. And yes, you might only sign 10 people, but those 10 people are your 100,000 person audience right there, right? Right. Micro influencers are much easier to deal with. 
So anywhere like anyone under 10,000 like are, is more than enough, especially if they have really, really good engagement as well. But do that first, build some form of social media presence. And then from there, start reaching out to them. In our opinion, it's not about talking to them and selling them on the opportunity of like, hey, we're going to be this big brand. This is our vision, blah, blah, blah. It's all about saying how much you love them, your content, how much you resonate with them and offering them a free product. It's not even exchanging some form of deal with them stating, hey, can you can you go and post this at launch? It's not about that. It's all about building the relationship with them in the DMs over a 30 to 60 day period. And then when you do launch, you hit them up saying, hey, we're just about to launch on Amazon. I really appreciate all, all that you've done. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that. And they could feel the need to post about it or not. But your goal is when your inventory is in Amazon to send them that product for free, zero cost. And um, you, you can get some good, good leverage uh, from that at, at the end of it. And Another, this is, I'll say one more thing. Recently, we've been trying uh, this new uh, this new platform. It's actually made from 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 Amazon people as well. Join brands. This, I was waiting really for that. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> and, experience. How do you like it? And I, I and Ian Sales will probably give you a credit for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I love it. And and the reason why is I think one of the hardest things is to do the influencer outreach. It takes time. So. For you to develop a campaign, it's exactly like putting a job posting up. For you to develop a campaign and have traffic come into you, at the end of the day, it makes you the, the first step of influencer outreach significantly easier. But here is where you need to be a little bit more granular because I've done multiple campaigns. And you know, I the first couple campaigns, I didn't spend the time actually looking at the influencers' accounts. I literally just took on anyone that I thought was pretty, for example, or I thought resonated with my audience. But if you just take the necessary steps to actually look into their profile, look at the reviews. It's exactly like purchasing a product on Amazon. You're looking for social proof. You're looking for good experiences for one. And then for two, you want to look on their Instagram, their TikTok, wherever your audience sits, you want to make sure that they have an audience there as well. So it's a natural fit to be able to ask them to promote the product on there as well. So join brands makes it extremely easy. It's like almost like a project management software where it goes from step to step to step and it's all automated. All I have to do is go in there on a daily basis, look at my look at my campaign, see who's applied, analyze those and bring them on and then analyze the content from there and doing what that What is the time frame in between you let's say you already found the guys uh in between your place in the order till their implementation. You I think the I think the um I think they have seven days to turn it around. From my okay. understanding, there are some people that take longer than that and, and they probably get dinged on their profile for it, but it's usually pretty fast. So, okay. uh, yeah, it's usually pretty fast. And when and are you starting scenes? And I have two questions here and we'll go to Eric and talk about PPC. <laughs> so uh, question number one, when um, you guys are looking at the influencer do you want these influencers to have a bigger presence and have their um, affiliate store pre-built or you're looking at mostly to their, their followers and you want the reel to go viral and uh, this is like your main goal to have a bigger reach uh, with their content? or both, like what is the priority? Because some micro-influencers, they don't have any affiliate stores at all. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I think it's situational depending on a couple yeah. of different things. Number one, the person who's launching the brand, what does their budget look like? As you can imagine, people that do have crazier engagement that probably have their affiliate store, they're probably gonna cost more money to work with them for a longer period of time. Again, what we like to tell our students is more of that micro-influencer under 10,000 that has decent engagement, okay? and they can create content for you. Um, I think that's more of the sweet spot, in my opinion. You might have to do it at a higher volume, but a lot of the time, um, you know, being able to have their content information, building a relationship with them, it kind of goes back to that point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's in, in our scenario, like we're about to launch this new brand called Modern, which are bath bombs for men with supplements. We're going crazy with influencers that one, are broad, and can promote products. And then two that are very niche focused to test kind of virality costs and all these different things, but there's a balance to it. But I think the biggest thing to understand is 
the more that you have on the front end in regards to who can help promote your product, the more external traffic you're going to be getting into Amazon. And then that's where that flywheel starts taking into effect. Organic rank pushes up, relevancy pushes up, indexing pushes up, everything kind of just starts to work in your favor. And uh, yeah, SEO is a huge focus in that as well. And what is the sweet spot for the amount of influencers? I Personally, as long as you have a 100,000 person audience, so that could be 10 of 10,000, that could be one person that has 100,000 followers. Personally, I like to be more diverse. The way that even we look at our Amazon business, we look at it as an uh, as a as an investment portfolio. The more products you have, the more sustainable you are. If one product goes down, you still have five income streams of products that are bringing it in. Same with the same with influencers. The more people that you have, let's say one person, because this happens pretty often, one person may not post or they just fall off the face of the earth. Right? You are right. still having nine people that are lined up that can promote it. So, if I were to give you a sweet spot. I guess, again, it's dependent on budget. You can either do 10 of around that 10,000 person or 10,000 audience reach and or five of like 20,000 because that way you have a little bit more than a micro influencer. But then you also have five that's a little bit more diversified. Okay. Well, that that's really fair. And like, I believe uh, the, ECO, the ECOS will go down at this point too because yeah. now we have external traffic. Totally. You know, Amazon is like, hey. <laughs> That's, yeah, Amazon loves their external external traffic for sure. Yeah, I think another well, another couple big elements of you know reaching out to influencers and and um, you know having success with influencers is also the product you bring to market. You know, a lot of what we teach our students right now, which makes a launch so successful, is what are they doing in product research and development that makes them unique. Like we talked about, like solving yeah. some form of a customer pain. If you can bring that all the way to you talking to the influencers and you can relate it to their audience on why this product would be good for them to share, it's going to be a heck of a lot easier. So really the secret to success on Amazon is two big things in my opinion is launching products, always be launching products. That's one big thing. The second one is bringing a good product to market. And that's where you're really going to see that sustainability. Everything with a good product is, is much easier. You can't have incredible marketing and advertise a bad product. Nobody's going to buy it, but you can be in a very competitive market with an incredibly good product and make money from that, right? It allows you to withstand, right? So, you know, talking a little bit more about advertising as a whole, obviously this strategy that Brian talked about influencers trying to reach people outside of Amazon is a, is a core component of launching these days, because especially if you, so for instance, like we have some students and like, you've seen some of our launches where people have these massive Yeah, that's days. great. Like yeah. I can tell you guys, uh, I respect both of you so much because <laughs> everything you put out there is legit first. When I see the results and the people are committing under their results, it's number two and there is no bullshit. Yeah. And I, I really like, I adore what you do and the approach you use. And like, you don't put out there videos such as like, find this product on Alibaba. <laughs> yeah. no, that, that's like, Buy it for this. Sell it for we that. have dabbled into that. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be yeah, honest. We have dabbled time. into it, but. Well, yeah. we all probably did at some point, but. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking There's no about value there right these now. days. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking about really important stuff. And, um, I love the complexity uh, of uh, uh, things you are combined together when, okay, here's an external traffic, but you cannot be without internal traffic. So totally. let's go to internal traffic and find yeah. out where is this link happening that Amazon actually becoming, Amazon is becoming loving to love you so much that now yeah. you are rocking your sales no matter how many reviews are on Absolutely. your list. Absolutely. So, you know, these days, obviously we know, and, and the reason why external is so important these days is because Amazon pay-per-click is not as easy as it once was. It's also way more expensive. So there's a couple of different things that we do depending on our, our students and where they're currently at. If somebody has, um, you know, less of a budget, um, how we're really building a ranking strategy with that individual is we're being hyper targeted to what Brian had mentioned, maybe lower volume keywords, something that's a little bit longer tailed going after, you know, 
more specific, higher converting keywords at the very beginning and trying to push organic rank at a slower pace, as opposed to you look at Brian and I's launch strategy, we're going after every possible keyword that we can possibly rank for. And we spend because we know that if we pump Amazon's platform for pay-per-click in the first 30 to 60 days, pushing for as much organic rank as possible, we may not be as profitable if not, or, or if anything make a lot well, of money it's normal in month, not to be profitable two. for a couple months and like 100 this pay paper play uh game that's it's a it's a paper like, play yeah. marketplace is really what it comes down to but we see the long-term vision for that right and that's why we go all in and you know our, our strategy is simple you know we go exact match go after keywords typically we'll do groups of five and week by week we're obviously hawks when it comes to tracking our rank, our organic rank, and we're always continuing to add new keywords every single week. And that's what the idea of with Amazon, like Brian had mentioned, it's a it's a search it's a search platform. How do we be in every single potential search as strong as possible, as good in position as possible, so that we can really reap the benefits of what Amazon has to offer, which is the organic portion of their audience. If we only relied on pay per click. There's one point in time where we're going to just start bleeding. And that's where it becomes very uns unsustainable. Along the way, um, a big element of what we focus on is indexation of keywords. Uh, we do this by targeting. Um, and these are honestly some of our best campaigns. And I'll tell you why. Uh, but we, we call them a product targeting rank campaign. So when we first set up campaigns, we, we launch an exact match for you know targets that we're going after. And then we launch a product targeting. And we go after all of our competitors. And mainly the ones, the ones that we usually see the biggest lift from are the ones that are getting a lot of the traffic. What we see this campaign does for us, it, it allows us to index for many keywords uh, because how that effectively is going to work is if somebody searches up a keyword and they see that you're targeting and they click you, Amazon's going to start making that link, which will allow you to start building relevancy. Your list is going to be start seeing or start being seen everywhere. But breaking it back down to having an incredible product, what we see with those product targeting rank campaigns, really that campaign is there to help us get indexation. However, it's not there for us to make money, but we see that it makes us a lot of money. And the clear indication is when we make and put the time into making a good product and we advertise against a competitor, regardless of reviews, and we're clearly solving something that they're not solving, we're taking that traffic and we're getting that traffic and we're getting those sales. So typically on most products nowadays that we are launching, we are, we're seeing those campaigns do really, really well. Not all of the time are they going to do well, but that's an incredible strategy that I always recommend people to do. Um, we always, and we encourage, we don't make it mandatory for students to get um, brand registry just yet. Moving into our new launch 3.0, which is coming out pretty quick here, uh, quick, pretty quick here. It is going to be mandatory for people to get brand registry because it is it makes all of the difference. Having a video campaign on day one, um, having A plus content, it's all about taking traffic and converting it at a high level, right? There's always two ways to to increase sales. It's push more traffic to your listing, or increase your conversion and make more money from the uh, the people who are actually coming to your listing as a whole. And obviously, at scale, it's it's all about fighting for the one percent. Like, how do I go from twenty to twenty one point? five or 21 to 21.5 right like it's all about doing that because when you know you're driving and you've worked the system it's incremental changes that are going to make all the difference and when you really start putting all these things into motion amazon's going to start favoring you and then you start having a listing that's just going to stick around it's going to start actually doing passive work for you and that's where you really want to get to uh, but within the launch you know we talk about the honeymoon period all the time everybody knows about the honeymoon period is it actually honeymoon period is it there tell me so you know i think everybody lately everybody has their own you know thought of it and you know although it may not be as prominent as it once was for us our indication is that we don't have sales history with amazon let's go create positive sales history with amazon let's tell them that we are in fact the seller that we are a player and regardless of how competitive the market is we can compete with the top dogs of the actual market. So, you know, I think there's speculation about it. You know, is it 30 days? Is it two weeks? Is it, is it three months? Or is it even a thing anymore? We don't know. That's the reality. But we do know that regardless of any product that we're launching, we're always in it to make a splash at the very beginning. And that's only that has always reaped the benefits six months, 
year down the road. We've always seen the benefit from that as a whole. So yeah, I mean, take advantage of that 100%. As you are continuing to, you know, launch um, more products, start exploring. Obviously, we we do discovery campaigns uh, as everybody should. At the very beginning, just so you guys know, I don't launch any broad phrase or auto campaigns until I get my first review. What I find with broad phrase and auto campaigns, really, uh, yeah, I don't personally, and that's okay. personal preference. And this, this first review uh, should come from Vine or the just first review. It, it doesn't matter. Vine or first review, it doesn't matter. Uh, we do sign up for Vine for all of our new product launches. That's also one of the benefits, obviously, to brand registry as well. Um, but the reason why we don't do it, and we test it against this, um, actually, I'm pretty sure it's a strategy that I learned from Brandon Young once upon a time, like years ago, and I still use it today. But what we tested against was the simple fact that what we find with with discovery campaigns because amazon is still learning your listing at the very beginning is they might show you in places where you may not be as relevant so it actually can impact your conversion rate without having social proof to back it up um so as soon as we get that first review first couple of reviews as soon as we as soon as you do that we launch an auto we launch our, our auto campaigns and broad and phrase match campaigns for all the keywords that we're currently targeting and uh we we start seeing those to, uh, to perform better um in addition to that as well, you know, we might not get that first review for a week. We might not get it for two weeks. Sometimes we've actually done a product launch where we didn't get our first review for a month. And did you I, ever feel that one review is worse than no review? Um, I don't I, think so. I always think one yeah. review. I mean, if it's a bad review, yes, 100%. Well, of course, a bad review doesn't matter. If you have first like 10 positive and one sabotage. negative, it's like if you have ratio 10 positive, one negative, you're dropping to like, I believe, 3.8 yeah. or yeah. something. And then it's hard to talk immediately. I know, I know. Like uh, here's a couple sabotage. things to unpack, guys. I was taking notes. So uh, when you said you are uh you're going guys after every single keyword that is possible so what is the best strategy or like what strategy that works for you when you're combining those keywords into the groups are you launching one campaign per keyword are you grouping them are those going to be broad exact like what do you do here i understand there is so many strategies that you can yeah. test the only thing that can tell you the truth is the testing yeah. But for those that are out there and they never did PPC or they did and it didn't work and they are doing it, not, not working. So what is your trick here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if I have a keyword over 10,000 in search volume, I'm in my launch, especially I'm putting in its own separate campaign because there's a lot of volume there, right? I want to sign it its own separate budget so that it can start optimizing and doing its own thing. If I have keywords under 3K, I'm typically grouping them within anywhere between three to five in a, in a campaign. Um, you can put them in all separate campaigns, assign it its own separate budget. Are they going um, broad or they're going exact? In the initial portion, we're going exact. Okay. We're going straight after going for the meat. We're trying to push organic rank on those as soon as we possibly can. Um, and then when we get those first couple of reviews, that's when we, we take all of the keywords that we're launching for, as well as additional keywords that we know are relevant for, and then throwing them into broad and phrase. And this is where Amazon's algorithms or ads algorithm is going to start working for you and start finding keywords that you can also go after. And my regular motion is, um, every two weeks, roughly we're going, we're downloading our search and report with accounts that we have more campaigns, we might even do this more often. And then we're finding other keywords that uh, we're, we're doing well on for PPC. And then we're, we're trying to push for organic rank on those as well. So it's a rigorous cycle of trying to get more real estate on Amazon. Um, and ideally we do it with data that is coming from our listings. The better we do that, the better we can capitalize on what Amazon knows we are already selling for. So that is key uh, when it comes to PPC for sure. I love it. Uh, another question about PPC. Tell me <laughs> when you're tired. Uh, so when you put the, for example, one keyword per campaign or three, five keywords per campaign, what budget do you usually set? And again, it's questions about budget. Do you have daily budget overall? Do you set any unlimited, limited budget per campaign? How do you approach this? Yeah, yeah, totally different. Again, completely. If I have a student that's like, I can't spend more than 3k this month on advertising, then we're breaking that into, you know, 30 days divided by, um, by that 3k. For Brian yeah. and I, 
I'm I'm making sure that we're not running out of budget during the day. That's how aggressive we get in our launches. Um, typically, I, I think I you know put 100, 100 to 150 per campaign, roughly. No rhyme or reason. That usually does pretty good um, in terms of not actually running out. Unless we have a keyword that we're going after initially that is like extremely high in search volume, then it might start running out. Um, but for us, the sweet spot in the initial launches, I would say, Brian, probably around anywhere between that 3K to 15K in search volume or those initial keywords we go after. What I find with going after keywords that are like 50K, for instance, and we definitely have those with every product launch that we do, is you start bleeding pretty damn quickly, which is, again, obviously at one point you're going to have to go after them. But I find it's easier to go after them when you have 5, 10, 15 reviews. It's much easier to get that conversion yeah. uh, without bleeding uh, an arm and a leg. So a lot of it's control. Um, and then again, just data, right? Like if I, if I see myself bleeding too much, I'm going in, I'm, 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 you know, if this keyword's not converting, I will likely shut it off. If we're not pushing up organic rank and not converting, I'll likely shut it off and revisit it in a couple of weeks or a month, right? There's, there's what no harm your, in doing that. Uh, that's awesome. What is your default for bidding strategy? Um, as in like down only, up and down, like that kind of? Down only, up and down, uh, increase the percentage to be on a high top placement, uh, minimum, maximum per bid. Like yeah. what do you usually do? I can share what I usually do. And it also depends on uh, the product, but I have my treat that freaking works. <laughs> so let's see if we match. Yeah. Um, so I, I only do down only. Um, I don't do up and down. Um, I, I find it's hard to it's hard to manage uh, at scale, in my opinion. So I'm down only every single time. And typically what I'm doing is I'm going two to three times for my uh, my exact match keywords, two to three times the suggested bit. So we're going pretty aggressive on them. By all means, you know, we're not going and, and we're getting those clicks for that expensive. But, you know, I'm trying to tell Amazon that I'm here to play and I want um, I'm willing to spend five bucks a click if you're going to give it to me for five bucks a click. Um, I have tested a lot, like doing a hundred percent increase on top of search and all that kind of stuff. But I keep going back to two to three times um, so just the, the the initial suggested bid and seeing where I go from there. Cool. What's your what's um, your trick? <laughs> so what I'm doing, I am, and again here I'm playing usually with um, uh, like watching what is going on with the campaign within like 24 48 72 hours so i'm reducing the bid till like for example amazon suggesting you i don't know 20 cents to 40 cents i am reducing it to 15 cents but i am increasing the um, uh, percentage to be on top of the page by like 200 mm -hmm. and then i'm doing down only so at the same time, so in, at this point, I am able to be in an auction based on the like this minimum bid. And this is how I'm able to win the competitors without increasing my bid up to like $10 Massive. per click or something like that. And I'm going down all this. So uh, it really helps. And we have products where we have unlimited budget, but we're not spending, believe it or not, more than 150 a day uh just because it's of course we're winning the market because of the competition and because of the customized product like of course all this uh all, all these things and components are there but by having this strategy uh we're not spending much on several products just because we have it we made it work. control yeah. Yeah. yeah and amazon like sees that. you like yeah they're ready to increase by 200 percent and Amazon understand like increasing like if you will like let's say zero point fifteen multiply two hundred that's a lot it's how, how many like it's a lot of dollars <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah it's a lot of dollars and Amazon like okay but it's down only so which means like whatever who is the highest we can we're always winning and again if the conversion rate is great then uh, you're ahead of everybody and this is how we've been able also achieve the if you saw in the middle of the page of Amazon you have uh, uh, uh they put it not just trending or now trending 
something trending so and we trending products tre trending products yes yeah. so now oh God, yeah. like most of the products that were using this uh, ppc strategy they got into this trending line oh top rated products. top rated top, top rated but also trending yeah top okay, rated yeah, yeah, and yeah. trending like they got this new new sign recently and like i'm like oh that's cute we're there uh, <laughs> that's kind, of, kind of nice do you use any software to manage ppc yeah we do so um i, I was trained um to do ppc by a gentleman named sean smith um do you know sean uh, maybe i do but maybe i don't it's he's not overly things. vocal uh these days but back in the day he was pretty vocal about what he was doing and what he was building he's you know he's he manages you know massive accounts as well uh but he has a tool uh, called ppc agility um and that's okay. what we use so all of my optimization processes um i do everything through bulk files but obviously now it's done through the software um so really you know tackling uh bleeding keywords uh, negating keywords and then um automated he has a formula that he calls the G formula, which is high A cost keywords, basically. Okay. And it's all, you know, basically looking at, you know, what is your, uh, your target A cost to, to, to where you're at and, um, effectively week by week, or we do the optimization. Yeah. Weekly, um, slowly getting it down to where you want it to go without making a massive impact. Like if I were to, if you, everybody knows, if you were to drop a bid from here all the way to here then you know it could ruin sales velocity pretty uh pretty damn done. quickly yeah, <laughs> yeah like, exactly I was, on here. I was i was feeding you and i was showing you that i'm here to share my profit with you but not anymore and that amazon well if you're not ready to share yeah. I'm ready to give you, you got to do it with good cadence for sure so the tool allows us to do that and um yeah so just ppc agility simple tool does regular optimizations still for them. us still use them i've been using them for Heck, like three or four years now, probably. <clears throat> okay. Out of I all the tools, I've never heard about them. Yeah, yeah. they're not. It's uh, it was it, it's specifically made for his students. I actually don't even know if you can go and get it unless you're a student of his. To be honest, you see agility. It'd be I our think, students uh, have access to it, but he doesn't advertise it. That's that's the thing. He made it for himself effectively, and then when he started mentoring people. The mentor, uh, the people he started mentoring were like, I want to use this as well. So he made it available for them. Um, and I know he actually has some cool things coming out. So maybe he is going to, you know, come a little bit more public with it. But um, just because it's the philosophy, philosophy that I've been following for a while, um, basically all my time learning uh, pay-per-click, um, I just stick to my guns and set up every campaign in there. I'm in there every two weeks just looking, bringing down those targets and um, works wonders. Sean would oh, actually be a really good guy to come on your podcast. He's a he's super a cool, cool down-to-earth, absolute nerd when it comes to data. And I feel like, uh, similar to what Eric said, he, he isn't too vocal with, with what he does. And I think that you guys would vibe for one. And for two, I think he'd probably provide a lot of new insight that isn't uh, potentially stuff that you, that you regularly hear. That's cool. I am waiting for the intro. Absolutely. Eric, write it down. So yep, guys, it's it's a lot of things that to be learned and taught to the listeners out there that are with us at this very seconds. And before we will wrap up, I want to ask you several questions. So as the twins, uh, when I was learning psychology, I, and <laughs> believe it or not, I have a master's degree in this. Oh wow! And I remember, okay. yeah, cool. one of the things that really. Uh, hit my mind when I was learning about twins is that these guys, these kids cannot live without each other. <laughs> it's And like based on everything you do, I, I would believe that it's kind of truth. So is it actually truth or not? Yeah. Yeah. You know, one, one thing I'd say is I think, you know, we've seen, we've, we've seen tons of twins, obviously. I think when we see a set of twins, we're just naturally drawn to them and we will have go, go have conversation. And those are some natural questions that not only the outside people that aren't twins are going to ask, but we also ask twins that as well. But I think it's situational because you'll have your twins like Eric and I, where we are truly like in a way the same person, although we do have different minds. I'm more of the creative. He's more of the analytical. That's why he talked about all the PPC stuff because he handles that kind of stuff. But we had the same friend group growing up. We had the same interests. We even have the same body figure. In fact, we never bought double the clothes because we could just utilize each other's clothes. 
that's, that's how similar we were. But there are twins out there that are just complete polar opposites where <laughs> you'll have like they're not even in the same friend group. They almost are just like siblings that are different ages um, and, and they are significantly different. And sometimes there's there's the twins out there that just absolutely hate each other and despise each other. And yeah. they just, you know, don't even feel like they're siblings to begin with. So it's dynamic. It's different. I think in every single relationship, I feel like the twins that have the power that Eric and I have, where you are very like-minded, uh, it's truly a leg to stand on because of the main fact that you have a support system in everything that you do. You have similar interests. So everything that you do, you can do together. And then you just have two person, two people doing the same thing and you can do things faster. You can do things better and things along those lines. So it's really worked to our advantage to say the least. That's really so awesome. Uh, and another question I had for you, uh, when, like, based on everything you told today um, and you shared, I noticed that you, Brian, just mentioned that you have different, um, I would say, responsibilities and yep. your brain works differently. And I see how respectful you are to each other. Like, okay, <laughs> I will let him speak and then I will not interrupt. And she's here, the, the one who's interrupting. So we will <laughs> let her speak. So that, that's really so cool. And when it comes to business, how, uh, how are you approaching the... Um, I would say obligations in between the two of you. Like, how are you um, taking the responsibilities of uh, what one of you is going to do and how, like, where are you going to support each other? Because you clearly know that, like, Eric is great with PPC and Brian is a creative guy, but mm -hmm. I'm sure you have some cross, um, like, some things that you have to cross each other and, like, we totally. You probably Right. So it's like, how does it work in between two of you? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, so to put it, um, as simple as possible, Brian being more of that, uh, creative person, he does really think really anything like, like product development, Brian spearheads, marketing, Brian spearheads, like all of the stuff that is super creative, ambitious, all that kind of stuff. That's what Brian's in charge of. For me, I do anything analytical right so systems technology process team like that's where i strive so i would say i'm more of an operator and brian's more of a, a visionary that's kind of how you know people typically look at a business relationship is like you need to have those two buckets of people um in regards what's that sorry chaos and order it can yes be exactly brian yeah. comes to me after he can't sleep because he has an incredible idea and I'm I'm the one there to shut him down or bring realism into the conversation. That's technically what I do. Um, in regards to like us stepping on toes, we're actually quite, quite good with that. Like, you know, I, I don't think there's ever been really a time where we had a massive disagreement on anything. Um, again, really, Brian comes to me with great ideas and I, I bring reason to it. And that's how we've always approached everything. It's, you know, it's, you know, does this make sense? Does it make, and if it makes sense, does it make sense to do it now? Should we do it in the future? And if it, it needs to be done now, then what's the plan to do it? And I break everything down and, and ultimately bring it to life. Yeah. Um, and, and Brian helps spearhead all the creation along the way, but I'm the guy that puts the plan together, figures out who we need, what resources we need, what needs to be associated to this, what is our timeline? And that's how we bring things to life. And that's why we've been able to do, you know, obviously we have Amazon brands, we have so much more on the side as well. Um, so the one yeah, thing there's a method the to the madness, hundred percent. The one thing I'll say, and, and I, I bring this up, uh, uh, from Ryan Moran again, cause I don't know if, if anyone in the audience here or yourself have, has read 12 months to a million, but one thing that he talks about early on in his book is exactly like Eric said in a business partnership and for a business partnership to work. So this is going to relate to, you know, putting twins aside let alone if you're just wanting to get into business. I think that it's a great idea to have a partner, but it needs to be the right partner. And he defines two partner, like a two person partnership, exactly how Eric said, an operator and a visionary. Imagine if you had two operators in one business, all you're going to do is literally butt heads with every single idea that comes right. through. And you're also going to lack a shit ton of vision that you need. You need to have inspiration. You need to have outside ideas coming in. And then you need to have the logic, the process, and the system. You need to plan and you need to execute. So you need to have both working together. There are people that can do everything. But I think eventually as time progresses, you really start to figure out what is your skill set. But even more importantly, what you enjoy the most, right? Transparently, I, you know, recently I've been doing a lot of system-based, operational-based stuff. 
and I can do it. I just don't enjoy it. So why would I spend my time and my energy doing that when I have someone even better at doing it? You know what I mean? So having the clear responsibilities outlined earlier on, that really allows you to have freedom in your own lane. I think that's how you're going to have the best cohesion in your business partnership. I love it. <laughs> Guys, two of you is the perfect picture for pretty much the world. You have great <laughs> partnerships, like you have great partnerships, you have great business, you have great relationships, you're really healthy and wealthy, you're young, uh, your mindset is in the right place, your business is blooming. Uh, it's nothing can be better. You can, there is always room for improvement, but you yeah. have great foundation. You have, uh, you have everything awesome. So I'm very honored to know both of you. And I, well, I'm looking forward to meet you one day in person. Yes, yeah, I'm still like you. going in the different direction. And last question that I have for some of my, uh, for some of the people that I'm interviewing, if it will be just only one thing till the end of your life that you will be able to do what this thing will be? Ooh, that's a good question. See the twins. <laughs> for, the first thing for me that comes to mind is uh, eating food. Okay, <laughs> and I say this for a couple different reasons. Um, I think eating food and as you start to, you know, have more fine foods or you go out for dinners, it's about the experience for one, but it's also about exploration for two and discovery. And I think me being a creative, I'm always trying to think of, you know, new things. And I like to think about things just in general. So for myself, I love good food. I love going to nice, fancy restaurants. In fact, mm -hmm. You know, you, you you talked about us not having Lamborghinis. We're not fancy when it comes to that. We're more so investing into experiences because I think that's more important for our life. And we grew up extremely frugal and, you know, we weren't around that kind of stuff, let alone nice food. In fact, my parents never took us out to restaurants. So uh, it was a missing thing that I love from my childhood. And it's something that I can experience with the life that we've built now. So that's what I'd say. And I'm not very a picky eater, so I really like to explore, and it just really gets me into. Uh, oh, that's why good... you're going to Italy and Greece. And yeah, like yeah, exactly. Places, For food, <laughs> food. Okay, Eric. Mine is uh, mine is taking baths, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I say that. Uh, well, first and foremost, like Brian had mentioned, uh, like we're launching a, a a bath bomb brand specifically for men. Um, and, you know, for those of you men listen on to this little uh, sneak peek into my world of bathing, I, I obviously I, I didn't bathe a lot as a kid, by all means. But, um, you know, throughout COVID, it was it was an exit for me, like how stressful it was having a job at that time. We still had a job for the first little bit, running a business and then going full entre entrepreneurship like uh, baths for me have been an exit. Uh, I use them as an opportunity for me to work. I use them as an opportunity for me to reflect. I use them as an opportunity for me to de-stress. Um, they have incredibly, incredibly impacted my sleep. Um, there are studies on this, guys. This is why we're building this brand. Like we are extremely passionate about it. There are studies, there's supplements inside of our bath bombs. I'm, I feel like I'm pumping the brand right now. But <laughs> at the end of the day, it. it's not just baths overall. It's baths, it's saunas, it's it's going to the steam room. I love being in some form of heat where my body can exert all of the negative energy that comes with entrepreneurship, like all of the stress, all of the overwhelm. Like everybody has personal things. Everybody needs some form of an outlet. I'm around um, my family all of the time. I'm around people all the time. I'm talking to people every single day. It's my little sanctuary. So for me, um, yeah, it's definitely something that I'm, I'm going to continue to do in my life. When I have my own new big home at one time in my life, like I told my fiance, I'm going to have a huge a, there is fucking a bath. For that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's all in, need. Between food, in between food and bathing, if you probably, when you've been doing product research, you so. And I remember a lot of people tried to sell this product on Amazon. That was, uh, oh my gosh, it's a bath tray or something. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was a blue tray that you can take to the bath. So you guys, as two twins, you can take this tray to the bath and enjoy it. <laughs> Throw yeah, 100%. The the <laughs> We're going to build a brand right for the bathers out there. And I mean... I'm passionate about it, as you can see. I think a lot of guys on uh, like list will that end up listening to this. Are like, oh no, bats are for women. Fuck that shit. 
excuse my French. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh no, I'm, I'm with you here. Listen, it's totally, it, 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 it's, it's an outlet, honestly. Like it, it gives us the ability, like I've, I've been filming TikToks in there, giving advice. I just started a TikTok on, uh, for, for am, like my Amazon life. Like I give, uh, I respond to comments in the bath. It's hilarious. Um, but yeah, oh just God, like an exit. Yeah, I, I, I embrace the hell out of it. And um, I love it. I look forward to it every single Sunday. I have like a ritual. I have a routine. It's part of my, you know, my wellness. It's, it's and, and that's an important portion to being an entrepreneur, but also just living like having some type of ritual or routine that allows you to be sane when the world is so crazy sometimes. I fucking love this podcast guys <laughs> yeah. and you're awesome we have to wrap up and every single link that we mentioned today about tiktok and the bath uh foodie and the brands and like everything they're following will be will be dropping under this uh video or voice podcast whatever you guys are listening keep in mind if you want to learn tricks and hacks about Amazon and how to launch and how to do it in a right way, please join these guys. They are <laughs> doing a phenomenal job. Really proud of them. Amazing.